I'll uh, call the meeting to order, and we have a very tight schedule. Obviously, we're uh, 35 minutes late already. Uh, and uh, what I intend to do is uh, let people testify on each of the bills first, and then we'll come back uh, and uh, take a moment and, and uh, vote, because we have a lot of people that have come uh, quite a distance, and uh, some of them can't be back here tonight, so I'd like to uh, let, let them testify, and then we'll go back through all the bills, and we'll probably have to come back tonight to finish up. Uh, so uh, we're going to start with uh, House File 485. If I can find, uh, what's about what? She was here a second ago. Yep, there well, she is. let's see here. That's this one. <laughs> Alan. Well, the mics are uh, strong. Do you want to hear one? So, uh, Representative Allen, would you uh, move your bill for, uh, is this, this going to be laid over? Or? Yeah. Where's this going on? Go. Yeah. Doug, does this have a fiscal one? No. Okay, so it's just, there's a property issue. There is? Okay. So, uh, if you would uh, move your bill and then it'll be laid over for possible inclusion. Uh, Mr. Chair, thank you. I move that House File 485 be uh, laid over and can be considered for possible inclusion in an ominous bill. Okay. Uh, present your bill then, or at least uh, uh, briefly present your bill and then we'll go to the testifiers and then we'll. Uh, uh, Move on to the next bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We've done, we've done this a few times, so I think I think we're pretty brief. Uh, House File 45 and the No Wrong Door Report, which is included in your materials, are the product of 18 months of, of hard work on the part of service providers, law enforcement professionals, philanthropy, advocates, and survivors of sex trafficking from around the state, with coordination input from the Departments of Public Safety, Health and Human Services and the generous financial support of the Women's Foundation of Minnesota. It represents the best ideas and best practices from around our state and around the country. The bill will put in place a statewide system of safe and secure shelter, trauma-informed care and services, and comprehensive training for law enforcement and others to effectively identify victims and to aggressively investigate and prosecute cases of child sex trafficking. It is an evidence-based, trauma-informed model. Stopping the trafficking of our children is not only a moral imperative, but also a sound investment for the state of Minnesota. A 2012 cost-benefit study in conducted by the University of Minnesota and Indiana State University showed a savings of 34 state tax dollars for every dollar invested in a model like the Safe Harbor No Wrong Door model. And, uh, uh, Mr. Chair, introduce uh, Jeff Bauer, Director of Public Policy of the Family Partnership, to walk through the bill. Welcome to the committee, and would you state your name for the tape? I will. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm Jeff Bauer. I'm the Director of Public Policy at the Family Partnership. Um, and I first just want to give a big thank you to Representative Allen for being our champion on this bill. Uh, as some of you know, we've been through kind of an epic journey through all the policy committees over the last few weeks. Um, she's just done a tremendous job um, throughout all of those committees. I also want to thank many of you on this committee. When I look around the table, I think over half of you are bill authors on this bill, and so um, I want to give you a big thank you for making that commitment. Um, and then I also want to give a quick thank you to some folks in the room. We have a group from Duluth, a group from St. Cloud, a group from Rochester, and others who came here just to be here today. Um, so thank you all for traveling so far to come in support of this bill. So as most of you will remember, uh, on July 20th, 2011, Minnesota became the fifth state in the nation to pass the Safe Harbor Bill. And what that Safe Harbor Bill did was it said that children who have been trafficked for sex in our state would no longer be treated as criminals and put in the juvenile justice system, but they'd be treated instead as the victims of crime. And so uh, we celebrated very briefly because we knew we had a lot of work ahead of us when that bill passed. Um, what some of you might not know is that Minnesota's Safe Harbor Bill actually isn't in effect yet, and it doesn't go into effect until August 2014. 
And the reason that was, and you'll hear a little bit more about this from our friends in law enforcement, was that at that time what we were hearing from law enforcement was, you know, we don't think that these children are criminals any more than you do, and we don't want to bring them to juvenile detention any more than you want us to. So if you can tell us where else we should bring them, we're happy to do it. And the problem all around this state was that place did not exist. And I'll tell you today that place still does not exist for these children. And so from the time that we passed this law, um, we have spent a lot of time developing a model. And what I really feel is a nation leading model in Minnesota. And so where we sit today is we have the model, the work has been done, um, and we have to implement it. So 16 months from today our safe harbor law goes into effect and we need to have a place for these kids to go. I think the model we've presented is, is conservative in its uh, financing um, and it's realistic. Believe me, we, we considered adding some padding to this bill um, and we didn't. Um, we came in with what we really believe is the minimum amount needed to take care of this problem. So um, for the purposes of this committee, if we can just go straight to Article 3, because um, I know you're short on time, and go to the appropriations in this bill. Um, there are a number of items that you'll see. Uh, the first is $762,000 to fund six <laughs> regional navigator positions around the state. Now what these positions would be is grant funded. They would be housed within existing organizations in uh, regionally, so roughly northeast, northwest, southeast, southwest, and two in the metro area. And we wanted to leave that flexible so that you know what works in Bemidji might not work in Duluth or might not work in Rochester. So they might be housed in a youth serving organization in one place, they might be housed in a county in another place. We wanted to leave that flexibility. So that's what that funding is for. The second item uh, in the Department of Health is a training fund. This is uh, one thing about child sex trafficking cases, or two things I should say. Um, victims are notoriously hard to identify without the proper training and knowing the right questions to ask. And the second thing is that these cases are very, very hard to investigate, especially if you see police departments in greater Minnesota where they might have one investigator for every possible case they need the training to get at the trafficker. So that's what that fund is for. The third line item uh, is program evaluation. Basically this is a brand new model. This is making sectors and jurisdictions work together in ways that they've never worked together in the state. And so we want to make sure that this is money well spent. We want to make sure we're getting the outcomes that we say we're getting. And so we put some money into evaluation. Uh, next line item are grants for outreach workers. Also around the state, 14 of them, also housed in existing organizations because we know that we're not getting to these kids right now. They're falling through the cracks. They're not being identified. We need to go out and find them. So we wanted to fund more outreach workers. Uh, moving on, we also asked for uh, a million in each of the next two years uh, for what we're calling the Safe Harbor Services Fund. This is really um, a comprehensive services fund. You know, these children come in needing everything that you can imagine because of what they've been through. And so this would be a fund that could uh, go for things like health care service, uh, mental health service, family reunification, um, employment training all kinds of different things and we'd imagine that would be, those categories would be developed in an RFP process um, and granted out. And then last but not least in the Department of Health, um, we have $82,550 for each of the years to fund um, a statewide director of child sex trafficking prevention physician. That's a fully loaded salary with benefits and all that. We got it right out of the state of Minnesota salary handbook so that's where that number comes from. Um, but again, because this is such a new model, it's so comprehensive, we really need someone who's looking out, holding the pieces together, administering grant funds, collecting data, all of those things. So moving on to the Department of Human Services, everything that is in this category has to do with safe shelter and housing for child sex trafficking victims. And I want to just be really clear about the type of shelter and housing we're talking about. Um, this housing is not the same as shelter for homeless youth. Um, we, um, we know you're also considering an $8 million ask to expand the Homeless Youth Act. We are a million percent in favor of that allocation as well. Um, we know that once a child is on the street, they're at tremendous risk for sexual exploitation. And so we hope that you'll pass that as well. But for children who have been trafficked, there's two specific concerns with their shelter. One is that they're almost always being directly pursued by their trafficker. 
And so if you put them in a shelter or somewhere else that doesn't take that into account, they're gone the minute they get in there. And so security is a huge concern. The second thing is the level of therapeutic care for these children. They've been through such tremendous trauma. Um, the level of therapy, the level of support they need is much higher. Um, and so that is why there's a separate ask for safe harbor shelter um, from the homeless youth ask. So if you get into the numbers, uh, roughly half of that ask, $4,472,500, is to operate the shelter beds. There's a variety of different types in this proposal, ranging from the emergency shelter beds, so that first place that a law enforcement officer or someone else can bring a child at 2 in the morning when they find them, um, all the way through different transitional housing. The other piece that I'm really excited about in this is uh, the last line item, which is foster care. This is a model that they've been using with some success in Portland and Seattle and other places where they actually have specially trained foster families that take these children in. And in some cases, that's really the best situation. So we want to try that out. Final line item um, is $4 million. This is one-time construction and renovation costs to expand our shelter bed capacity to reach this population. You know, right now, at this very moment, there's four shelter beds in the entire state of Minnesota for child sex trafficking victims. Four beds. And they all exist right here in St. Paul at Breaking Free, who you're going to hear from. We estimate on the low end, on any given night in Minnesota, we're going to need between 35 and 40 once this law goes into effect. <coughs> so we've got between four and 40 to build over the next 16 months. It's, uh, it's no easy lift, but we have to do it. So that's uh, the numbers. In a nutshell, and I just want to wrap up by saying, you know, we've been through a lot of policy committees now. We've been through a lot of hearings now. And there's no doubt that morally speaking, the legislature is with us on this. This is a bipartisan bill. I think we've had unanimous votes in every committee except judiciary, which is a story for another time. If any of you want to hear it, we can meet later. Um, <laughs> But on the moral ground, we, we know this has to be done. But now we're talking about the money. And all I want to say about that is in 16 months from now, this law is going to change. And we're going to have trafficked children who need some place to go. And so we're either going to build it or we're not. But in August 2014, there's going to be a whole lot of kids that need somewhere to go. And so I thank you for your consideration. I know you've got some really tough decisions ahead of you with this budget. Um, but I, I hope you find that this is an investment worth making. Thank you. Um, Mr. Chair, we have Mr. Choi. Uh, welcome to the committee, uh, Mr. Choi. And uh, would you state your name for the table? Absolutely. Uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, for the record, my name is John Choi, and I am the Ramsey County Attorney, and I'm uh, honored to be here in support of this very, very important bill, House File 485, and I want to thank Representative Allen for her leadership in bringing this forward, uh, and for you, Mr. Chair, for uh, uh, your public comments about sex trafficking and uh, giving the time that this uh, bill deserves. Uh, I really believe that um, the greatest human rights atrocity that's happening in our community right before our eyes is uh, the buying and selling of children for sex online, and that's happening here in the state of Minnesota. And, and I want to make sure that this committee understands that the victims of this crime are not children just from St. Paul or Minneapolis, but they're children from all over the state of Minnesota. In fact, if you have runaways in your community, you've got this problem. Because what we know is that runaways, uh, because they're in a vulnerable situation, 30 to 40 percent of them are going to be sexually exploited. Um, and they're coming from all over the state. In fact, in the past year, we prosecuted 12 defendants uh, of trafficking involving children. And those victims, uh, at least almost half of them, come from greater Minnesota. And so I want this committee to understand that this is a statewide problem. And I really believe in order to make a difference around this issue, uh, we need to have a victim-centered approach. And what I mean by that is, is that uh, we appropriately define who the victims are in these particular situations and, to, and with the safe harbor law and the actions of the seven county attorneys in the metropolitan area and also in St. Louis and Olmsted counties, uh, we believe that the best approach is to understand that these children who are coming into the system are not criminals, are not delinquent, but they're children, children in need of protection. 
and they are, they are um, uh, victims of crime. And so starting from that premise, what we need to do is to have uh, an approach that makes investment uh, into providing the intervention services, the short-term uh, shelter space, and the long-term housing to really get at that. And, and, and the reason why that's so important is because when you start treating these children as victims and you, law enforcement and the people in the system are doing something to help these children, they're more willing in the long run to testify against their trafficker. And that's one of the large, uh, the biggest challenges that we face is because the victim is going to be so critical in a prosecution without that participation, it makes it very difficult to hold the traffickers accountable. But when we have that approach, uh, it works. In fact, just recently in Roseville, uh, there was a 17-year-old girl from um, outstate Minnesota who was being trafficked at a hotel in Roseville. And because of the victim-centered approach that was used by the Roseville Police Department, uh, by the time that we got to trial, that 17-year-old trusted a police officer named Ben more than she trusted uh, the trafficker who she thought she loved, uh, Samuel Cozart, who was a really bad man. And we were able to get a conviction and a sentence, and it's the longest sentence that I am aware of in the state of Minnesota for 21 years. But he's in prison for 21 years for, the, for his crimes. But that couldn't have been done without... Uh, the the uh, efforts of the law enforcement community and also having some services. And in Ramsey County, we're very lucky because we have have developed a runaway intervention program that does offer intensive uh, services for victims. And I think that was a big part of how this case uh, transpired. Uh, and, and I just want to conclude by saying this. When we make this investment, you, talk, you heard about that if we make a, a, a dollar of an investment, we get a return of $34. A lot of that research was done on the runaway intervention program in Ramsey County. Uh, but another important part of this is the results. And in order to qualify for the intensive services in the runaway intervention program in Ramsey County, because of the lack of resources, you have to have been sexually exploited two or more times in order to get access to the most intensive services just quite frankly because we can't handle more than 75 people a year, 75 kids a year. But after a year in that service, it's a public health uh, response, uh, working with a public health nurse. Uh, after a year, with respect to three issues, teen pregnancy, suicidal thoughts, and incidences of self-harm, those children who have been sexually exploited two or more times do as well or better than kids uh, in the Minnesota Student Survey, kids who have not been sexually exploited. So when we make these types of investments, uh, they can work, and they can also have a benefit for holding people accountable. So Mr. Chair and members, uh, this bill uh, provides uh, this really important part of the, the missing piece that we have right now. We've got it right in terms of defining who the victims are, but we need to have an investment made, and that's the hard part. Uh, but uh, I, I can tell you that uh, if you do make this investment, and we have to make this investment, uh, we will make a difference. We're doing it at Ramsey County, and I know that we can throughout the state of Minnesota to end sex trafficking. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Choi. Is uh, Sergeant Snyder? Welcome to the committee. Please state your name. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. My name is Sergeant Grant Snyder. I'm a detective with Minneapolis Police Department. I'm the lead investigator on all sex trafficking, human trafficking related uh, crimes for the city of Minneapolis. Um, I appreciate being here today to talk about this legislation, talk about this bill. I appreciate the chance to address you all. I remember the very first juvenile sex trafficking victim that I ever encountered about 13 years ago, and her name was Amanda. And I remember what Amanda looked like and that soiled mattress in the basement in the floor of that crack house when we did that search warrant. I remember her laying there with no pants on, a soiled t-shirt, sores on her legs. She was a runaway, a little girl from northern Minnesota who had found her way to North Minneapolis. We pulled her out of that crack house. We didn't have the training we needed. We didn't have the right ideology. I didn't see her as a victim at that point. And we sent her to St. Joe's and she went back home. And home was a hostile place for Amanda. <coughs> and eventually Amanda would come back to North Minneapolis because her she'd been abused sexually by her father and an older brother and had gone on for a long time. So she did what anybody would do. She escaped. 
She came back to North Minneapolis, and over the next two years, I would rescue Amanda six more times. Six times. And every time we pulled Amanda out, we would send her someplace that treated what we believed were to be the most pressing issues at the time. She was a runaway, so we sent her home. She was chemically dependent, so we sent her for chemical dependency treatment. During that process that lasted two years until I finally lost touch with her, <clears throat> we never came close to touching the very real issues that affected and caused her to repeatedly be involved in a sex trafficking arrangement. We didn't, we didn't have the training, we didn't have the resources, and we didn't have the ideology necessary to treat Amanda the way that she needed to be treated and give that little girl what she needed and what so many other little girls out there today need. But we fixed those problems with our ideology. We have started to train police officers around the state. We have started to train people across the country. And we, we know the right words. We know the correct training. We know the way to approach these victims now. Among the most daunting problems today, though, still remains the resources and what do we do with these children. Do we send them home? Do we send them to JDC? We know that's not the appropriate place for these kids. We know they're not going to get the treatment that they need there. They're not going to get uh, a staff that understands their trauma. I mean, imagine we, we know what it's like to be a sex assault victim. We understand from the very articulate and, and sometimes tearful words of survivors of sexual assault. And we know how traumatic that experience is. Now multiply that exponentially by several incidences of sexual assault, of imprisonment, of torture, and all the things that go into being a sex assault, I'm sorry, that go into being a sexual trafficking victim. That's what we're dealing with here. And that's why these resources, resources are so critically important. Last week, we had four new victims. Yesterday, just yesterday, we found two more little girls, 14 and 16 years old. Next week, there will be more. We're going to have contact with these kids, and we're going to pull them out. But the big challenge for us in law enforcement is what do we do with them? Where do we put them? Because we can't stop rescuing these kids. But we've got to make sure that we're only rescuing them once and not having to rescue them six times. Thank you uh, for your testimony. And uh, next, we have uh, Sergeant Vandermeer. Thanks. Welcome to the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. My name is John Bandemer. I'm a sergeant with the St. Paul Police Department. I'm also the director of the Gerald Vick Human Trafficking Task Force, which is a, a task force of law enforcement, investigators, and service providers, non-governmental organizations working together to address this issue of human trafficking and, and what we're here to talk about today, sex trafficking of minors specifically. Uh, I, I can only reiterate what Sergeant Snyder has already told you. Uh, the, the victims, where they come from, uh, County Attorney Choi has explained that this is not just a Twin Cities issue. Uh, I have a trial scheduled for next month in Ramsey County, which includes two young girls from the Twin Ports area that were in into, into St. Paul and were sexually trafficked the first day they got here. I was yesterday down in southeastern Minnesota to interview another sexual trafficking victim who was in St. Paul recently. Uh, these girls and these kids come from all parts of the state. And, and we can talk about how um, you know, we, we preach a victim-centered approach to investigating these crimes. And that victim-centered approach means that we have to be able to address the needs of the victims so that we can successfully investigate and prosecute traffickers. But we can't do that if we don't have a place to put them, a safe place to put them, that will address the needs that they have, physical, emotional, mental needs, so that they can be equipped with the tools that they have to have to be able to understand what happened to them and be able to tell us a story. You know, this is, you know, we're law enforcement. We're charged with uh, putting the bad guys in jail. And we need the, to hear the stories of the victims to do that. And you can't do that in the first interview. You can't do it in the second or third interview oftentimes. This process takes months. And we need a place to be able to put these kids. So. Um, aside from the very essential services that are needed for these, these girls uh, when we encounter them right away. And it, currently in Ramsey County, we've been, we've been using this model for several years in Ramsey County. But every time we come across a girl, we're still there scrambling to find a safe place. Because oftentimes home is not that safe place, and we learn that JDC is not that safe place for them. Uh, it's not the appropriate place. Um, but, um, you know, we're charged with, with investigating and prosecuting people who commit crimes and sexual trafficking is a crime. And we need the help and support 
uh, and we need to show support to our victims that are encountered to have successful prosecutions. So I'd like to, um, I guess, just reiterate again what Sergeant Snyder and County Attorney Choi said that, that you know this is obviously the morally right thing to do, but we are we're going to be having a problem as we go about teaching this victim center approach in the state of Minnesota, uh, and these victims are going to be encountered again uh, weekly on a weekly basis. They are. Um, we need a place to put them. We need a place that where they can be safe and they can feel safe so that we can investigate these crimes and successfully prosecute them. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you for your testimony. And uh, <coughs> next, uh, uh, Nikki Beasley, I think. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My name is Nikki Beasley, and I'm the Director of Programs at Breaking Free in, uh, right here in St. Paul. Victims of human trafficking are especially vulnerable to the debilitating physical and psychological symptoms of trauma resulting from their repeated, intrusive, and long-term abuse. Providers working with this population, like myself, emphasize that trauma recovery is critical to a victim's ability to repair and regain his or her life. Minor victims of sex trafficking are frequently in need of services, including out-of-home placement. The most pressing need is safety. In addition, they need emergency housing, basic medical assistance, food, clothing, and legal services. We as providers are advocating for residential facilities in which these victims can receive support, comprehensive services, and a start on the path to recovery. We recognize that these minors meet the federal statutory definition of a minor victim of sex trafficking and therefore they deserve the human humanitarian protections called for under the law. Specialized and intensive care is needed to ensure long-term stability and exit out of the life. We know that these programs need to be safe, trauma-informed, po population-specific, and adequately funded. <clears throat> Furthermore, programs currently housing sex traffic victims, such as runaway and homeless youth shelters, detention facilities, and group homes need additional training and access to appropriate resources to better serve this population. The future safety and stability of this vulnerable population of victims rests on our ability to provide a safe space in which they can recover from the trauma of their trafficking situations and be given a chance at a new life free from exploitation. On behalf of Breaking Free and many of the victims that are here in this room, we thank you for your time. Is there, is there another test part? Yes, I'd like to introduce um, an amazing young woman and a survivor, Valentina. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chair. It's critical to have supportive services and safe housing built around the dynamics of prostitution, especially for minors. Neither one is more important than the other. You cannot just answer the demand for one need and expect that alone to be able to solve our problem of prostitution. The mental and physical toll of prostitution cannot be fixed overnight. It takes a combined effort of many special services with staff who are well trained and well aware of our situations that us women and girls have been through. The road or life of prostitution is both tragic and traumatizing. With that, the road to becoming a survivor can be just as painful of a battle. We need a huge support system, stability, and structure somewhere that we feel safe. Safe support of structured housing is a huge piece to this puzzle. Without housing, us women and girls will go back to what we know or be found by our traffickers. Prostitution is not something that we choose. It's force, even if it's due to lack of other choices. The problems and effects of prostitution is very real, and it's time for Minnesotans to step up and set an example to our nation to fight back and show that we are not further going to allow us women and girls like myself and others in this room to be victimized any longer. Thank you. Thank you for your uh, testimony. It's, uh, we're very happy to see you. Uh, and and he's someone that's been successful overcoming what happens to him. Uh, with that, I think we're, uh, that's the final testifier, and so what I want to do is uh, uh, we're going to come back. Uh
when we get done here today or this afternoon, we're going to have uh, come back at 6 p.m. in room 118 uh, for questions and amendments, whatever, and uh, vote. Uh, well, this bill will be laid over. In fact, all the bills will be laid over for possible inclusion, uh, except the, the one. So uh, thank you for your testimony, and uh, we're going to uh, take this bill back up uh, later. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, yeah, so 118 in the Capitol. Where the, uh, there's lots of committees going on tonight, so it's going to be very, very difficult. Uh, uh, we can get a room. Uh, Representative uh, Atkins. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> Again, uh, members, there's going to be a lot of amendments for this committee, and we'll deal with those amendments. So we're just going to get the presentation of the bill and, and the witnesses, and uh, I would move uh, House File 779. Uh, yeah, he recommended to pass and refer to the Ways and Means Committee. So, and uh, if uh, folks would... Uh, Hold the noise down a little bit. We could. Uh... Thank you for fighting. Uh, uh... Uh, Representative Atkins. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and Mr. Chairman, there are a couple of authors amendments uh, that I'd like to uh, have go on the bill whenever it's appropriate. If you want to put those on at the beginning, so we're talking about the bill in the way that. Uh, that we'd like to present it, that would be fine. We'd like yeah, to why, why don't we do that? So, right. uh, where are the amendments? And the author's amendments, Mr. Chairman, are the A5 and the A6 amendments. Uh, where's the legal? You, you want to do the bill? Oh, Mr. Chair, I'll move the bill. And I'll move the amendment. Okay. So Representative Abler moves uh, the bill, and he also moves uh, A5 and A6, so, which get the bill in the form of the author. And Mr. Chair, just, uh, we've got just kind of a technical, if we could move the A5 uh, independently, because there is a slight uh, oral amendment that we need to make okay. to the A5. Okay, so uh, Representative Abler moves the A5 amendment. Yeah. So, representative, uh, do you want to explain the, uh, the oral amendment? We need to Sure, I'll, I'll walk through the oral amendment. Perhaps the maker of the motion would be kind enough to incorporate it once I've referenced it. Uh, the hospitals raised a slight concern um, about the, the A5 amendment, so we put in a little bit of language that uh, we think satisfies them, and that is on line 1.10. After the word hospital, insert the words existing in the area. So to repeat that, after hospital on line 1.10, insert the words existing in the area. Uh, Representative Abler, would I'll you incorporate that. that. I think that's a friendly amendment, Mr. Chair. To my, <laughs> I've spent a lot of time on this amendment. I think so, that it makes okay. it better. <laughs> we have the A5 amendment uh, as amended. Uh, any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? So the uh, A5 amendment is that adopted and then uh, as amended and Representative Liebling has a question. Thanks Mr. Chair and just as I'm looking at this actually this amendment for the first time on what line 1.9 um, it just it says notwithstanding comma and usually when you say notwithstanding it says notwithstanding something so I just wonder if that needs clarification uh, Representative Atkins or just Tell us what you're trying um, to do. Mr. Chairman. Representative Atkins. We just like the word notwithstanding. But uh, <laughs> no, it actually, it's, it's notwithstanding the language immediately above it is my understanding of that. And so if you read the, the previous sentence, uh, that's what it's notwithstanding. I hate that word, actually, Representative Lee, but it's a reference to the, to the line immediately above. 
Representative Lee Wind, is that well, Thanks, Mr. Chair. I, I don't want to be too picky here. It's just, you know, when we're putting things in law, we want people later on to be able to read them without context and understand what they mean. Maybe the word however would, would be, is the word you're looking for there? But I, it's up to you, Representative Atkins. Well, I won't say any more about it. Mr. Chairman, Representative Weaveling, I, I know that the summer advisor has worked very hard, uh, and they may have a purpose for that. So, but I'll discuss with the uh, revisor's office whether, however, it might be a better. And we've got another staff or so. Um, but I appreciate the suggestion. And, okay. So, uh, <coughs> yeah. Okay, and then uh, what was the uh, the next one? Mr. A6? Mr. I'll move the A6. Representative Abler moves the A6 amendment. <coughs> Would you describe that, Representative uh, Abler or Representative Atkins? But Mr. Chair, if we might, uh, there is a, uh, a slight tweak on that one that Ms. Cleveland, I believe, has the language for on line 2.16. Uh, and if uh, she's comfortable sharing that, uh, I'd appreciate it. Ms. Cleaver. Mr. Chair and members, um, the oral amendment was on line, page 2, line 16, delete create and insert that creates. And after the first incentives, use insert to use. Mr. Chair, when that gets repeated, I'll incorporate that. So could you uh, just repeat that, uh, sure. Ms. Cleaver? Uh, to the A6, page 2, line 16. Delete create and insert that creates, and after the first incentives in that sentence, uh, insert to use. To use? To so, so it would use. read uh, to, the line would read either require an enrollee to use or that creates incentives to use, comma. So, uh, Representative Aber, uh, I incorporate that, Mr. Chair. that in, into the uh, A6 amendment, and uh, now the A6 amendment. And Mr. Chairman, uh, the A6, uh, we don't have complete peace in the valley yet, but that's what we're striving for. And there's several elements in the A6 uh, that seek to achieve that, as we've listened to some who've raised concerns about the bill. It's all right with you, Mr. Chairman. I've got Mr. Munson Regala here from the department who can do a brief walkthrough of the A6 uh, amendment for you and kind of talk to you about the uh, which pieces of it we brought together with the, the various stakeholders. Mr. Munson Regala. Uh, Mr. Chair, members, uh, Manny Munson Regala from the Minnesota Department of Health. Uh, the A6 reflects conversations and feedback from the dental um, providers, uh, uh, insurance providers, the indemnity carriers, and the Council of Health Plans. Uh, as well as the hospitals and the advocates, and we thank them all for their feedback. Um, if you want to walk through 1.1 through 1.7, those were suggested technical amendments to clarify uh, what our intent was with respect to the bill. Uh, starting at 1.9, this was intended to clarify that the rules we were talking about applied it to pedi pediatric dental. Uh, I know that Representative Loeffler had suggested the inclusion of the word pediatric at the, one of our stops, so that might be something you may want to do here. Um, from 1.16 to 1.23, again, those are a number of technical changes suggested to clarify uh, what um, provisions we were thinking about when we uh, had our original draft. Starting at 1.23 all on to 1 point, uh, sorry, 2.9, that's a new version of the con content on the marketing standards that are going to apply to all products. The intent is to make sure that marketing standards are non-deceptive and do not result in uh, discouraging sick people from enrolling in a plan. <coughs> Starting at 2.10 to 2.13, this was intended to accommodate the concerns of those carriers who rent, who rent uh, networks from other carriers 
that network adequacy standards should be the responsibility of the entity that actually creates the network. That made sense to us. We accepted that suggestion. 2.15 is the beginning uh, with, with the oral amendments we talked about. Um, this is language is about um, talking um, about when you have to have network standards. Um, we again have the language around does not manage owner contract, so that's the intent to take care of the rental um, situation. We did have one concern uh, at the department that um, you not have multiple small subsidiary companies that uh, that you always just use to rent network to evade uh, compliance with the statute. So we included a uh, aggregate uh, requirement that if it got to a certain size, you now become too big to be ignored. So that was the logic there. Um, 2.22 to 2.26 requires that folks who rent the, their networks to other entities must submit the copy to us for approval uh, for the purposes of ensuring that in fact they are the entity agreeing to take responsibility for compliance with the, we just want to be sure we understood who was going to be responsible for complying with network provisions. 2.27 to 2.34 uh, reflects, sorry, 2.33 um, reflects technical changes that the carriers suggested to make it clear, particularly to align with the Affordable Care Act's um, definition of what were required essential health benefits. 2.35 is to make sure, and I believe that's in the policy section. Yeah. So that we're going to be getting uh, data from the plans on um, quality um, improvement measures. This language is to make sure that we don't end up in duplicative standard um, gathering. That, um, that if there is data that's already being provided, we don't ask for it twice. In 3.2, uh, we, we embed the network rental provision again. In 3.6, um, the plan suggested that if they were accredited, that that should um, be an acceptable um, satisfaction of the quality improvement measure. Accreditation is a process by which you as a carrier go through a uh, extensive two to three year review. Uh, I believe someone from UREC here is going to be talking a little bit more about the accreditation process. Um, we were okay with accreditation being a form of a deemer, that if you were accredited, you would satisfy the requirements. But we wanted it to be at the highest level of, um, of accreditation. Or um, I know that I understand that UREC accredits in certain areas, in the five core areas where we believe it was material to the concept. Uh, section 14 of 3.25, again, deals with the Required of the Affordable Care Act that essential health benefits include pediatric dental. Uh, this was intended to clarify what requirements applied to pediatric dental uh, as long as they were part of the essential health benefit package. And that is the A6. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, one more material element, 4.4. Uh, Since we are now going to be articulating new network standards uh, in this bill, and I think that might be a typo. I'll have to go back and look. We didn't need the existing network standards. So if we were going to replace the network standards with the network standards in this bill, uh, we wouldn't need the existing ones. But I think that might be 6.14, so I will have to check. While he's, well, he's checking that, Mr. Chairman, we'd be happy to take questions or concerns. But that's a, a walkthrough of uh, the amendment, and for the most, well, not for the most part, in, in its entirety. Uh, it was an effort to uh, take those concerns and address them that uh, some of the stakeholders had raised. Okay, any questions on the A6 amendment? Well, Representative Lawford. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and Mr. Uh, Mamala, you did mention how I had in an earlier stop um, defined limited scope dental plans as limited scope pediatric dental plans just because I felt like 
at first I'd never heard of limited scope dental plans. I didn't know what we were referring to when the Affordable Care Act specifies it to pediatric, and I'm just wondering if on the next stop, I don't want to mess with it. You've got it in a whole bunch of different places with lots of language in here. But I just do think it, it just makes it clear, because otherwise people are, who are looking for dental insurance may think this applies to them, and it obviously doesn't unless you're under age 19 or 18 or whatever the cutoff is. Representative Acton. Mr. Chair, Representative Loeffler, I don't think there was an intent to, to drop that. It was just one of those things that we were drafting with the revisor's office. And we'll take that as a friendly suggestion to do in the, uh, assuming that the committee's understanding of that and, and okay with that. I believe we, did we get the sent to us if we passed today to Ways and Means? Is that our next we're, one? We're going to Ways and Means. All right, fair enough. So, Representative Loeffler, that'll be an opportunity unless there's an objection by this committee to, to uh, take back that language. Okay, any other questions on the A6 amendment? Uh, I don't see, see any, so all those in favor of the A6 amendment uh, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? No. So the A6 and A5 amendments are uh, adopted as, uh, and I think they were both amended a little, uh, as uh, amended. Uh, why did, uh, yeah, why don't you uh, now uh, present the whole bill as as, a <laughs> as briefly as possible. And I was going to say, Mr. Chairman, I, I know at least uh, my sense is that there's a considerable amount of crossover between this committee and the Health Policy Committee. Uh, and so what I'll ask Mr. Hunson Regala to do, he had a presentation that he went through at great length, I think, in the in the policy committee. Uh, my guess is that he's best situated to walk through the bill briefly and then we'll circle back for any questions or concerns that members may have, if that's all right with the chair and members. All right, yeah, I'm going to turn it over to me. Mr. Munson Regala. Uh, Mr. Chair and members, um, the bill is intended to do um, a number of things. The first and most important thing is to ensure that the consumer protections that uh, individuals have are the same no matter where you buy your product, whether you buy it from the exchange, outside the exchange, uh, from a walk-up kiosk, from a storefront uh, agent's office, it will be the same set of protections. Um, the areas of consumer protection that are included in the bill include uh, a number of key ones from our perspective. The first one being the requirement that if you're a consumer, no matter where you go, you have the ability to purchase a product at different metal levels. So we're asking the plans that if you offer a product, you must offer them at uh, the option of silver and gold. Um, the second uh, area of um, consumer protection we want to be the same across the entire marketplace is the marketing standards that apply to how you sell product. Um, there are existing marketing standards today. They're slightly different between those applicable to HMOs and insurance companies. We're taking this opportunity to have one standard for all companies and, and just as importantly for the member's purposes, one regulator. Uh, Commerce will be responsible for enforcing all the marketing standards uh, throughout the marketplace. The third substantive consumer protection we're uh, suggesting as a common standard is there are certain information disclosures that are required for plans sold within the exchange. That information is going to be used by consumers to make a decision on whether or not they want to purchase a particular product. We'll be, we believe that information be, may be uh, useful for consumers no matter where they purchase their product. And we would like to share that same information with consumers no matter where they purchase. Uh, Representative Grunhagen, do you have a question? Oh, did you want to, you know, I've got a number of questions. So do you want to wait till tonight to deal with those more? Uh, you know, unless you, if it's just a clarifying question. Uh, you, I don't have too many clarifying questions to say that you <laughs> Mine go a little bit uh, more expansive on the bill. So I could wait for tonight okay. if you put, and then uh, you can get through the rest of your bill. So, but I appreciate being kept on the front of the list. Thank you. So, Mr. munson Regal, if you could continue. Uh, there are... A um, few more minutes, though. Yes. So the... And I'll just then highlight the, um, the two more remaining sort of substantive uh, sections we would highlight for the committee's attention are network adequacy. Um, I believe I had the, um, the pleasure of explaining network adequacy once to Representative Mack. 
and that's the concept that if you buy a plan with a network that there be access to care. So we want to take our existing standards that are applicable to HMOs and extend them to the marketplace. Uh, the last substantive um, protection that we're trying to extend is a requirement around service areas and that's where plants market their products. Uh, we want to be sure that service areas be at least the size of a county but if you want to write a service area smaller than a county, you need to get approval from the Commissioner of Health. And in so doing, you need to demonstrate that you don't design the service area in such a way as to be discriminatory or, uh, or um, focused on excluding people with health disparities or, health or worse health outcomes. Uh, we essentially want to make sure that if you want to write part of Ramsey County, you don't just write Mac Groveland and Skip Rondo, for example. <laughs> for those in Ramsey County who know what I'm talking about. But that's the, that's the kind of the logic of, um, is to be sure that service areas aren't designed to do uh, the functional Im uh, impact of redlining. That's the high level concept of our bill. Oh, I'm sorry, um, last two sections, um, quality assurance and uh, accreditation, we've talked a little bit about it. I know that one of the representatives from one of the accrediting entities will be here to talk more about what accreditation means. Accreditation ensures that companies are engaged in a process of continuous improvement uh, and quality. Um, we are actually curious to see what we can leverage from the work comp companies do around accreditation. That's not part of our concept yet other than the waiver, but that's certainly a dialogue that will continue with the accrediting entities and uh, carriers. Uh, we're uh, right on time, I guess. Uh, Mr. Bartsch, were you going to make a comment? Um, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, for the record, my name is Jeff Bartsch. I represent Medic. I'm also here today on behalf of the Minnesota <coughs> Council of Health Plans. Um, just to say, uh, as this bill's moved through the process, we appreciate uh, the work of the author and the agencies to help resolve some issues. Um, we do agree with the agency's objective of uh, applying a uniform and, and consistent standard. Our concern has been that that standard is a workable one, uh, not an overly aggressive one. There's a few areas of the bill that uh, we're still trying to work through with them. Uh, I'm confident and hopeful that we can, uh, but just want to recognize our support of their, that effort to date and uh, appreciate the A5 and A6 uh, as a reflection of that work. Okay, uh, thank you, Mr. Barish, and uh, uh, we have uh, one other testifier on another bill that uh, has to talk right now, and then he's, he's going to leave, so uh, thank you for your presentation. We'll see you again at 6 o'clock. Sounds good. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. 118 Mr. Capital. Uh, Don Isles uh, is here from Anoka County Human Services Director, and uh, he's going to test... Uh, wants to talk about House File 869 because he can't come back to see. You. Good morning, Welcome. Mr. Chair and members. My name is Don Isles. I am the Anoka County Human Services Division Manager. I'm testifying today on behalf of the Association of Minnesota Counties, which, as you know, is a voluntary membership association of all 87 Minnesota counties. I appreciate the opportunity to address the committee today. House File 869 represents one of AMC's top priorities for this legislative session and is part of our overall property tax relief package. <coughs> this bill is a priority for urban, suburban, and rural counties across the state of Minnesota. Currently, counties pay for all health care costs for county jail inmates. This includes medical care provided within the jail, on an outpatient basis, and on an inpatient care basis. There is no state or federal reimbursement currently for this growing cost. Over the past decade, the inmates of our jail have required more and more costly care for chronic diseases, for mental illnesses, and for communicable diseases. Under the 1965 federal law that created Medicaid, anyone entering a state prison or a county jail lost Medicaid eligibility. The reasoning at that time was that states and local governments had historically, historically taken responsibility for inmate health care costs, 
so the federal, state, and Medicaid plans should not be needed. However, an exception to that general rule opened up in 1997 when the Department of Health and Human Services wrote to state Medicaid directors saying inmates who leave state or local facilities for treatment in local hospitals can get their bills paid by Medicaid if they are otherwise eligible. In addition to those incarcerated, those on probation or parole or under house arrest were among those who could participate. So far, six other states have taken advantage of the 1997 ruling, and four others are considering it. Counties, would like, counties in Minnesota would like to access to this federal reimbursement to cover this inpatient portion of our jail health care costs. Yeah. This is particularly important right now, as many of our inmates will likely be considered to be newly eligible under Medicaid expansion, which means the federal government will pay for 100% of those costs through 2019. The inpatient hospitalization costs that counties pay for incarcerated offenders is rising, and it's a highly unpredictable and difficult to manage portion of our overall jail health costs. As you can well imagine, the cost for a single inmate that is admitted to a hospital for a significant period of time can be extremely problematic. These costs are particularly challenging to small rural counties because of the impact on the county's overall budget. For example, in St. Louis County, inpatient hospitalization costs for this population have varied significantly over the past several years. <laughs> In 2010, St. Louis County's inpatient hospital costs were $315,000. The very next year, in 2011, that expense dropped to $202,000. The expense dropped further in 2012 to $170,000. This unpredictable fluctuation in county costs in St. Louis County likely mirrors what transpires in every county in the state. The overwhelming majority of the cost to provide medical care to jail inmates will remain with the counties even if this bill becomes law. Counties are required today to pay for care within the jail facility and will continue to be responsible for any cost for medical care of inmates that are provided either in the jail or on an outpatient basis. We believe that House File 869 allowing the state of Minnesota to draw down federal medical assistance dollars will be of great assistance to all 87 counties in the state. We are very pleased that we have a bipartisan group of co-authors on this bill, including you, Mr. Chair, and other members of this committee. We thank you for your support, and certainly I would be, would be happy to answer any questions now or later this evening. Okay, we're uh, going to have to uh, uh, go into recess, and, but I would like to uh, uh, say hello to Commissioner Carter. Thank you very much. Uh, from Anoka County as well. Uh, Ramsey. 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 Oh, Ramsey County. Just wishes he's Minoka. Which is fine. So, uh, members, we're going to recess until 6 p.m., and we will meet at uh, 6 p.m. in room 118 of the Capitol, but before we recess, would anybody like to? Mr. Chair, so Representative Abler moves the minutes of uh, March 19th. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor sure. of. Sure, yeah, uh, I'll take them back. Signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. 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 Aye.